One more thing about that, uh, this autocracy versus democracy, the old world, when I'm talking about the old world, I'm talking about Europe in particular, they were emboldened by the Civil War to re-enter the Western Hemisphere. So um, uh, the French backed uh, Maximilian of Austria. They tried to put a king in um, Mexico. I'll talk about that later. Uh, the Spanish tried to retake the Dominican Republic. Uh, they tried to retake Peru. So what you have, one of the ways you might want to think about the old world, uh, it's a counter-revolution against 1776. What you're seeing in the 1860s uh, is a counter-revolution against the idea of democracy that started in the modern version anyway with the American Revolution in 1776. The last thing I'll say is the Confederacy uh, supported this counter-revolution. Uh, they worked very closely with the aristocratic and the monarchical powers uh, of the old world. And this is where my work has focused on, uh, the, the Confederate support of this counter-revolution. I'll introduce that idea now, uh, but and I'll develop it at a later point. Now, the Confederacy in the early parts of, uh, of the war, what they told Europe was, look, we, we are a separate nation within the United States. Uh, we're like the Greeks. During this period a little bit earlier, the, Greek, the, the Greeks had broken from the Ottoman Empire. And the Greeks said that they were a sovereign people separate from the Ottoman Empire and that they deserved their own independent government. There were all kinds of minority populations in Europe that were trying to establish themselves as sovereign nations. And so this is what the Confederacy argued. The Confederacy argued that Southern slaveholders were a separate people with separate customs within the larger United States, and that it deserved they deserved to be uh, independent, that they were an independent people separate from the rest of the United States. This was their argument. Uh, it didn't uh, wasn't very successful, but this is what they argued. Let me talk about Lincoln though for a second. Uh, Kind of, I think it might be a little confusing for you that, that Doyle begins his narrative with this thing called Garibaldi's question. And, you know, why does he start in Italy? What's that have to do with the Civil War? Well, it's part of that larger struggle that I was talking about. In the 1860s and even before that, you, you had a struggle to unify Italy. Uh, Italy uh, was not unified until the late 1860s. Actually, Italy, the nation of Italy, is created the same decade as the United States. Um, again, it's kind of this global struggle that's going on that simultaneously. Uh, Garibaldi's a freedom fighter. He's trying to establish a republic in, in unified Italy. He's trying to unify Italy, but he also wants Italy to be a democratic republic. He doesn't want it run by a king, hopefully. Or if it is run by a king, uh, that, the, that the parliament or the congress of uh, Italy uh, has most of the say. And, and the model for that, think about Great Britain, right? Uh, we've got uh, Queen Elizabeth and what Princess Kate and whatever her husband's name is, William and Prince Charles and that whole drama over there. So you still have royalty. Uh, I apologize to the English student in the class. Um, you still have royalty in Great Britain, but really it's Parliament, that, which is an elected body that controls the government of Great Britain. So you still have the facade of royalty, but the real power lies in the democratically elected Parliament, right? So that's kind of a middle way uh, between a, a classic monarchy and, and a democracy like we have in the United States. So for Garibaldi, uh, he's trying to rec uh, create a uh, unified Italy that is democratic, and he just can't believe that the Civil War is not about emancipation. Uh, when these Union diplomats, when they go to him and offer him, kind of amazingly, the command of a Union army, um, Garibaldi says, what are you guys doing? Why are you fighting this war? And remember, this is 1861, right? And I've talked a lot about Lincoln's thinking about why he hasn't moved towards emancipation. But what you've got is, is you've got a battle for public opinion in Europe. And, and there were a lot of liberals in Europe. And we, when I use the word liberal in, uh, in this context, 
it, it's not like liberal and conservative like in 2016. What a, what a liberal is basically is someone who favors democracy, democratic government, okay? And so for a lot of European liberals, not only Garibaldi, but liberals in, in France, and at this point France was controlled by a, a, a king, uh, uh, Napoleon III, who was uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew. Um, so for a lot of forces in Europe that wanted Europe to be more democratic, at this point maybe only 5% of the population of Great Britain had the right to vote. Something like that. Really tiny, even smaller in France. So popular suffrage was very, very narrow in Europe at this point. Certainly less than 10%, and maybe even less than 5%. And there was a lot of agitation uh, to you know, open up voting rights to all men initially, and then women as well. And so th this is what the liberals are fighting for, and this is why they're so worried about the failure uh, of the United States, that if the United States fails, all their struggles to gain uh, more, you know, more representation, that more people have the right to vote, their enemies, their aristocratic enemies can say, look, this is why we don't want popular soft suffrage. It, it leads to civil war. And so for, for European liberals, for, for proponents of democracy uh, in Europe, the stakes in the Civil War were very, very high because if the Union is, is split, it's, it's an example to the rest of the world that democracy does not work. And so for European liberals, they're very concerned about what's going on in the United States. But at the same time, they start putting pressure on the United States. And this is what we start to see from Garibaldi when he meets with this Union diplomat. He's saying, what the heck? Why? And again, this is 61. Why isn't the war for emancipation? Why are you fighting this war? If you're fighting this war just for territory, just for dominance over the South, he called it uh, an intestine war, which is kind of a funny, you know, interesting way to think about it. He said, no one's going to support that. That's just the usual stuff. If it's just a war of power and, and just to bring the South back, I, I don't have any interest in, in, in a war like that. And either do all the, the, the pro-democratic forces in Europe. But if the war becomes a war of emancipation, that is a whole different kettle of fish. That's something we're very, very interested in. So Lincoln, the Lincoln administration, initially the message that they wanted to send out to Europe was that the war was very narrow, that the, uh, the war was just about uh, bringing the South back into the Union, um, that it, there was no really any moral purpose to the Civil War, except, you know, you not keeping the Union together, which is it's not a small thing. Um, that if the, the quarrel was just over secession and territory, uh, Garibaldi said, we're not interested. But if you make the war about emancipation, suddenly now we're very interested in the war. And so... Lincoln's what Lincoln and he's talking to his diplomats he's starting to hear the message that his definition of the war in Europe is just a very narrow war to bring the the states of the south back into the union having nothing to do with slavery that that message wasn't resonating either with the old guard because the old guard was actually happy to see the union collapse and it wasn't resonating with european liberals pro democracy forces in europe as well and more and more by the end of 61 into early 62 Lincoln is starting to get the message that pro-democratic forces in Europe who are fighting for democracy in Europe itself, they want the war to become about emancipation. They want the war to have a moral dimension. And so this is one of the variables 
that Lincoln is thinking about as he moves toward the emancipation. He's fighting for public opinion in Europe. And one of the reasons he's fighting for public opinion in Europe is he wants to keep uh, Europe, especially England and France, out of the Civil War on the side of the Confederacy. Now, the ruling classes of Europe were very, very pro-Confederate, but they're unwilling to jump into bed with the Confederacy uh, because public opinion is very mixed. There's a lot of opposition to the Confederacy, especially among the working classes. So early in the war, Lincoln and his Secretary of State Seward, they're more focused on the governments of Europe. They're saying, look, this is just a rebellion. It's illegal. We want to keep this very contained, very neat and tidy. But in doing so, Lincoln is losing the pro-democratic forces in Europe. By early 62 and into the summer of 63, Lincoln is starting to realize that the governments of Europe aren't going to be supportive of his administration anyway, and that he should start focusing on the broader pro-democratic public opinion in Europe. And the only way he can do that, the only way he can really get their sympathy is by, uh, is by making the Civil War a war of emancipation. Now, that's not the only variable that leads Lincoln to, uh, to, towards emancipation. There are a number of other variables. But it, it, what it does is it gives us an international context for the thinking about the Civil War that Lincoln is aware of public opinion and the power of public opinion in Europe. And he's very concerned to get public opinion on his side. And from the point of Europe, that pro-democratic forces in Europe are very concerned that if the, that if the South wins the Civil War, the South is able to leave the Union because it's unhappy about the results of an election, that this undermines the idea of democracy on a global scale, which would be a huge setback to them.